humanity at sunset. Scientists believe life can be greatly extended. What then are the chances and implications of living forever? There's always a request that someone sings this lovely old song. And so we like it in the fellowship. Right? Ready? Today, there are more than six million people over 65 in Britain. Nine out of ten of them suffer that apartheid of old age, loneliness. These are some old people from Openshaw near Manchester. Every Thursday afternoon, they gather to sing. It's the high point of their lives. Well, the worst thing about being old is that you're condemned to death. Immediately you say, you've retired. They don't allow you to have any interest in life, and therefore you've got to build up that interest and start life all over again. You miss all your friends when you get old. They'll die, leave you, and you're alone. As long as you can look after yourself, it's all There's right. No but when you can't, you get nowhere. Mm -hmm. And afraid of tumbling if you stand up. Mm -hmm. well, what's the good of wishing to live any longer? Like it or not, old people like these are promised a hope of extended life. Research biologists in several countries claim to be on the verge of a breakthrough. A breakthrough which could let us choose how long we wanted to live. Dr. Benjamin Schoss is the president of the newly formed American Lifespan Society. Well, we've reached a new period in uh, biological knowledge whereby medical science can devote itself not so much to conquering death by warding off infectious diseases, but we now have the possibility of actually considering the whole prospect of changing our lifespan. And uh, this is going to be on the medical agenda for the, well, from here on in. If we can succeed in slowing up the aging rate, we can break out of the limitation of the biblical three, sco uh, um, three score and ten. This is one attempt at that breakout for the treadmill in the aging research clinic at Lankenau, Philadelphia. The patient is suffering from premature aging caused by overweight. The study is being conducted by Dr. Walter Baltz. What we have been doing here uh, this afternoon is a study on his work performance and the different uh, foodstuffs that he metabolizes during the performance of a piece of work, such as that here on the treadmill. One need only turn to a whole series of life insurance tables to observe the tremendous effect that obesity has on premature aging and premature mortality. I think another way of uh, saying is this would be that obesity increases the aging process. A fat person at age 40 may be similar biologically to a thin person of age 50 or even older. A man is as old as his arteries. And I think one need not stretch the point too much to say that if we could in some way maintain the vitality of our arteries, our plumbing system, that our aging process, our, our deterioration just in general, would be far delayed. This, too, is age research at Lankana. Here, the strength of old people is measured. The patient cycles until a heartbeat of 160 to the minute is reached. The research is conducted by Dr. Alan Barry. This test itself is one of about 30 which we administer to 
the people who go through the aging research clinic at Lankenau. This new technique makes possible the use of work tests with people in this age group, with those individuals with heart disease and so on. I'm interested in how we can retrain older people to use those abilities which they had when they were, they were 20, 30 years of age. Now, there are many people who will say this can't be done. Well, I have published some work recently to show that it can be done. And it seems to me that many of these things that we say human beings can't do have not been studied well at all. I think if, more, if there were more institutions doing this kind of work, then the outlook for older people could be changed tremendously. Going very well. Shouldn't be over. Those were some of the experiments being carried out to conquer age. But already, science has extended life in other fields. This was a party held recently in London. All of the people here owe their lives to a new technique of body engineering. It's been called spare part surgery. Ten years ago, it barely existed. Now, spare part surgery is already beginning to extend lives. We've begun the age of the artificial man. The results achieved read like a handbook of New Testament miracles. Two weeks ago, a Mexican woman was given an artificial heart valve. It was successfully inserted by the American surgeon Howard DeBakey. He believes that the transplanting of whole human hearts will be possible by 1970. Right now, 26 parts of the human body are available on a drive-in replacement service. They range from artificial arms to nylon arteries and include such things as rubber lungs, artificial kidneys and metal knee joints. But even this may soon appear clumsy. By 1975, surgeons are confident of being able to provide substitutes for most of the diseased parts of the body. Some of the spare parts of the future will be human replacements, deep frozen and stored in a spare parts bank. The artificial parts made of plastic, silicones and metals are already being produced on a factory scale. Our present large cumbersome devices will be transistorized. Within the lifetime of nine out of ten people living today, plastic electronic hearts will be working. Now, one could raise the question, can we live indefinitely? Theoretically, we can, because the material that we're made of, protoplasm, is immortal. It goes on in an unbroken chain to the first life that appeared on Earth. And we're part of that same protoplasm. But in our bodies, the protoplasm, the protoplasm deteriorates. And as we gain sufficient knowledge, we'll learn to prevent this deterioration. So that if our knowledge is at this level, let's say, we may be able to live as healthy, youthful individuals to 120. Increase that knowledge, and we may be able to go on to twice that age, to 200, to 300. There's no upper limit to our individual life. The limit is our knowledge. In England, time might be stretched here at University College London. This is Dr. Alex Comfort, the leading British authority on ageing, who is director of the Medical Research Council's investigation into why we grow old. This research has been going on for 10 years. There are two main sorts of cell in the human body which could be involved in ageing. We have some cells which don't divide ever, which live as long as we do, the cells of the brain, for instance. We've also got cells which we can renew, uh, the cells of the skin, the cells of the liver. If you cut yourself, your skin heals through the renewal of cells. And there are two real possibilities here. It might be that the ageing process is due to the fact that an old man doesn't produce as good new cells as a baby. It might be also that ageing was due to the loss or damage or change in the fixed cells, the ones we can't renew. And what we've been doing has been making a study of the fixed cells in uh, mice, muscle cells in this case, which don't renew during life, but which, as we all know, deteriorate. It's this deterioration which Comfort is trying to stop. Somewhere at the very basis of life, he argues, we have an inbuilt clock which runs down. His research team have been experimenting with drugs and radioisotopes, trying to keep that clock going. So far, the experiments have only been performed on animals, but the ultimate concern is with man himself. Already, a formidable amount of facts about ageing have piled up in room B21 at University College. 
although, of course, I can't assure you that I can do something about it in the future, or that anybody can, if I didn't think that somebody would one day, I don't think I should probably be here working on this subject. Now, I want to make it quite clear, we don't aim to make everybody live on and on and on and on, like Methuselah, in increasing decrepitude. What we do want to do is, first of all, to make the people who live to old age now fitter than they were. Ideally, you might live to be 80 and die at 80, but still be as fit as a fiddle right up to your last few days of life, and that would be a gain. And the other thing we hope we may do is to tinker with the clock which times aging so that we get a few more useful years of life inserted into the lifespan. For some people, the search for longer life ends here at a discreet clinic in London. The process is cellular therapy. Cellular therapy is basically a transplantation of cells into a human system for regeneration. The cell treatment was discovered by Professor Niehans in the 30s, where he found that he could transplant cells into the human organism. Um, it comes from unborn sheep. The cells come from unborn sheep, which are specially reared in Switzerland. When the sheep or you becomes pregnant, the embryo is taken and dissected into the uh, various segments representing liver, spleen, stomach, and so on. Occasionally, if people are found to be sensitive to sheep tissue, then calf tissue or even sometimes pig tissue, but mostly sheep tissue because the human body tolerates it much better than any other. Peter Stephan is 23. His practice of cell injection has brought him wealth and esteem. His clients are largely rich, middle-aged people. He himself has had some medical training, but is not a qualified doctor. In this country, no one need be registered to inject human beings, but you do need a license to inject animals for research. Nobody has yet proved or disproved cellular therapy, and Peter Stephan himself believes in it. Its price? It varies according to the nature and the amount of injections required. Obviously, cells from a liver are less expensive than those from the pituitary gland or any other part of the endocrine system or any part of the nervous system. Usually, a course of treatment in London costs between 150 and 200 guineas. The world of cellular therapy is a hushed and lavish one. There have been many claims for its success in the last 10 years, despite the fact that it's been banned in several countries. The Food and Drug Administration of America have forbidden all imports of cell treatments there. In Italy, too, it is officially considered dangerous. The French Medical Service frowns on it. Other countries have welcomed it as the source of perpetual youth. In West Germany, it flourishes. In this country, medical opinion is against it. If they know something about it and dislike it, then it's perfectly all right. If they studied it, but I don't think many practitioners have studied it sufficiently to mm. either condemn it or accept it. Whereas it can't make you any younger, I mean, it can't, for example, make a person of 40 years, 39 years old, but what it can do is to give them a little more life for their years. In other words, restore what they might have lost. Eventually, it will be a treatment which everybody will be having. Nobody likes the idea of becoming old and senile. And in fact, with the cell therapy, it's not necessary. <laughs> This is a cemetery in Michigan, USA. According to one man, the people buried here have been needlessly destroyed. The man, Robert Ettinger, is an American convinced of the hope of immortality. He has an alternative to burial. What we are proposing instead, of course, is that uh, immediately after these people die, they be frozen and kept in surroundings which could be at least as beautiful as this, but which will actually preserve life, or at least preserve uh, latent life, preserve the potentiality of life so that the uh, people who have lost their chance for life at the present time because medical science is not yet sufficiently advanced uh, will nevertheless have a chance for greatly extended life in the future and life even of a quality that will be much superior to the life that we know today. Uh, every individual should have the opportunity to decide this for himself and of course my private opinion is that as soon as people understand that the opportunity exists, the program will become nearly universal. This demonstration took place at the headquarters of CryoCare Incorporated in Phoenix, Arizona. CryoCare is the first commercial organization to start the freezing technique. The first man to be frozen already lies here, and this is Ettinger's pattern of the future, a world where the dead would be stored in low temperature capsules in which the body never decays. 
The Life Extension Society, with Ettinger as chairman, started out in Washington with half a dozen members. Now it has over a thousand in ten countries. It has an international newsletter with the slogan, Freeze, Wait, Reanimate. They claim that in the future, organ transplants will become a commonplace of surgery. Their Freeze Now, Live Later movement has had the backing of several of America's leading scientists. The United Nations have been petitioned to start an international research program on freezing. The Life Extension Society claim that for every day this is delayed, thousands are going to an unnecessary grave. Already, over a thousand Americans have jumped at this slender chance of an everlasting life. Among them, Ted and Barbara Claver. And I feel there is, feel there is a definite possibility for this, and there's, after this was uh, decided, uh, I enjoy life, I enjoy doing things. Uh, there's many, many things I uh, really enjoy doing, and I, I want to continue as long as I can. So this is the obvious thing to do. It, it just seemed natural, and uh, so this is why we went ahead and set up this program of for our capsule and uh, for this uh, to prepare to be uh, frozen. We've written our wills to um, say that we would like to be frozen when we die, naming a person in town who will be sure to carry out our wishes. Until the children are 21, if anything were to happen to them, we would of course want to have them frozen. Um, we have put um, insurance in our names just for this purpose. And we feel that this is what we would want to do for our children. We happen to love them very much. And I know if we were uh, all frozen together, we have the chance of being together again. I feel this is something that I would do for Barb and she would do for me. Um, there's only one al other alternative, and I've got quite a few qualms about that. So I think, um, no, this, 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 to my way of thinking, is uh, definitely the way to go. Ed Hope is president of CryoCap. The CryoCap that I was telling you about. This capsule has the first person frozen in it now. Really? This, yes, this is. And incidentally, this is the second capsule that was made uh, to our knowledge. Now then, uh, this outside is steel, and inside has your super aluminum. There's a vacuum drawn on it. How cold does this uh, get? 320 degrees below zero, that's Fahrenheit. It practically turns a person, it's more or less in the glass, so to speak. I mean, that's an odd way to explain it, but it, it gets that cold. And that's what happens to the body. We arrest all decay, all damage, all movement of all parts for all time. There are now four firms like CryoCare in America, the home of the saying that the only thing that will buy you time is money. Yes, your capsule cost $4,200. Now, it would take roughly perhaps six, seven, or eight hundred dollars for the physician, mortician, and all other handling uh, at the, that particular time. So you would figure somewhere in the area of above 5,000. Now, generally, as I had explained to Ted earlier, if you were to have an insurance policy, let's say they covered in the area of $15,000, you would use some $5,000 rough uh, to complete, cool the body down, have everything set as, as we had earlier discussed. Then you would take your uh, balance and place it in a trust fund, uh, primarily with your attorney. Uh, this will bring a fabulous return. In fact, if a person stays frozen long enough, they get out of that capsule mighty ri uh, rich. The freezing technique has been called an improbable fantasy, a real hope for unlimited life, or a rich man's club which reflects the paranoid American fear of death. Its future success or failure, though, depends simply on knowledge. Even its strongest critics agree that the technique involves no medical impossibility. They do say, however, that the consequences will be disastrous in an already overpopulated world. Ettinger has an answer for them. When you consider a particular individual at a particular moment, then the overpopulation problem is irrelevant. Uh, just as the overpopulation problem is irrelevant if you are trying to save the life of a dying child. You just save the life if you can. You don't worry about whether or not that child is going to make one too many people in the world. You simply save him. And by the same token, we save whom we can, and we worry later about population problems. 
I think we must recognize that dying is an essential part of the pattern of living. That's the way that we're organized. Unless we think very carefully about the results of the researches now going on, then those results may be not increased happiness for mankind, they might indeed be disastrous. Dr Donald Gould is a physiologist turned journalist. He now edits the magazine World Medicine. One of our own most eminent medical scientists, Sir George Pickering, who's Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford University, was speaking a few, years, a few weeks ago at a symposium in New York. And he foresaw the time when, as he put it, we should have a population of ageing minds in healthy bodies. He was thinking about the problem of the brain. Perhaps we can replace hearts. Perhaps we can replace kidneys. We can stop bacteria killing people with antibiotics. We can do all these things. At the moment, though, there's one organ which there's no prospect of replacing or keeping young. That is the brain. These doubts are reflected by a growing number of people, some of them research biologists themselves. Dr. Walter Bort Sr. is director of the Aging Research Clinic at Lankanau. In our nation today, in the United States, there are over uh, 20 million people, men and women, 65 years of age. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt about it that with passing time, this number is going to uh, greatly increase. Our hospitals today are overrun with the problems of uh, the health and, well, and medical problems of people over 65. I've always said that the, uh, the mind is the measure of the individual, and it doesn't matter how good his heart is or uh, his digestion is if his mind is gone. You've heard of people who have died uh, uh, several years ago and uh, are still vegetating, and they'll be buried maybe sometime next year. These are the living dead. These are a tremendous threat to our uh, um, uh, modern uh, uh, society and modern world today. What we need is a social commitment to pro provide the necessary scientific effort. That means very large sums of money diverted into this area of scientific research. It's inevitable that we're going to learn how to slow down the rate of aging. It may be inevitable that doctors and biological scientists should work towards Increasing longevity should work towards discovering the mysteries of aging and discovering methods of slowing down the aging pro process. But if they do this, then I think they must recognize that they have a very heavy responsibility towards society. They must, I think, spend some part of their effort and their talents in working out what's going to happen to the people for whom they are preparing these extra years. I think we have got to reorganize society in the future. I think we've got to start now in order that the extra population of old people is looked after and is given the sort of life that's worth living. Our whole present policy of compulsory retirement for everybody and the social role which we expect, or rather which we don't expect the old to play in society, is years out of date in view of the much longer lifespan which we already have. And I think that the changes which would be necessary to accommodate any successes we might have or other workers might have in this field would be small compared with the ones which are already overdue. So perhaps it's a good thing we're doing this, even if we don't succeed, because it may make people think about the situation of the old in society as it is today. To do all these things, but remember that life still holds things that are good. It's for you and me to win through and show we are not beaten. It was meant, my friend, that you should. <laughs>